Can you live with yourself when you have killed somebody? This haunting question consumes Ross Collins, whose life unravels when he causes a fatal accident just one day after passing his driver's test. Sinking into the morass of despair and self-loathing, he seeks refuge in the Alpha Course, hoping to find redemption through Christianity. There he encounters Omega B, a theology student grappling with her own crisis as a faith that has always defined her collapses. B challenges the message of the Alpha Course, offering Ross a very different perspective on Christianity and the Bible. As he desperately looks for a path of redemption, and she tries to work out who she is and what she is going to do with her life, their story unfolds against a backdrop of conflicting ideas between Alpha and Omega. There we go. Welcome to Tux TV. I'm your host, Jimmy Tux. And uh, I've got a special guest with me, uh, Paul Clark. He uh, just wrote a uh, book, and he was also an alumni of uh, Unshaw Podcast. So uh, we get to be on together. Yeah. <laughs> Hello from England. How are you? Uh, yeah, I'm very well. I'm in Chicago. It's a gorgeous day. We survived the, uh, the eclipse yesterday. Oh yeah. yeah, was that? Did you get to see it in Chicago? I got to see. Um, I got to see uh, it to be about ninety-two percent covered. Okay. Like uh, it just looked like you were wearing sunglasses and then without wearing sunglasses, it was still light and everything. One thing I did notice is uh, how vivid my shadow was because normally mm -hmm. midday the the sun's you know just there's a shadow, no big deal. But your the shadows were very vivid. It was quite uh, quite impressive. I posted uh, on my um, on my com um, on my community tab a picture of what it looked like from a phone with the uh, glass, those uh, paper glasses over it, and it was a beautiful picture. So, and it shows that it's covered about ninety two, ninety three percent. I'd say. Mm -hmm. We, we had one in 1999 or 2000, something like that, a total eclipse. Oh, wow. And that, that was great. I really enjoyed it. And the thing I remember, it was a kind of darkness that you don't usually get. Yeah. You know, it wasn't like sunset. It wasn't like, yeah. it certainly wasn't as dark as night. But it was very, very different from anything, I, a different kind of light from anything I'd ever experienced. Great experience. Yeah. Yeah, it's it, looking at the pictures because I could have driven about two or three hours uh, and uh, been in total darkness for a bit. Mm -hmm. And um, but uh, I was working. Yeah, I was selling or not selling, depending on your point of view. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I read off um, the the clip of um, that uh, you had posted. About a summary of the book uh, that you you just uh, just came out last month. Tell us a little about it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the book is a novel, and it was I've always wanted to write a book, uh, a kind of atheist book, but I've never known how to approach it because I would have to do decades and decades of research full time to to write something that you know is a better contribution than other people are doing and until very recently i was busy working so i couldn't do that so eventually i decided to do it in a novel <laughs> and then in a novel the depth i mean it does go quite deep but you don't have to go quite as deep as you would in a in a non-fiction book um and my inspiration was two books do you know them have you read them zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance no Sophie's World. well zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance it was a big hit in the 1970s, and it's a semi-autobiographical novel about a philosophy uh, lecturer 
who is recovering from a nervous breakdown. And it's a combination of his recovery from a nervous breakdown and a road trip by motorbike across the United States. And he combines that with a history of philosophy. And it's it's a beautiful book. It's a really well written book. Um, and at the moment, his alter ego appears. It is so creepy. It's one of the most creepiest mm. passages I've ever read in a book. Um, because he, he calls his past self Phaedrus and suddenly Phaedrus appears and you think, what is going on here? <laughs> um, I really recognize it, recommend it. It's, it's a fantastic book. Um, and the other book that inspired me is a book called Sophie's World, which was written by a Norwegian writer called Justin Garda. And this is about a girl who starts receiving messages from a mysterious teacher. Mm -hmm. who teaches her about philosophy. She's about 13 years old, something like that. And again, through his messages, she gets a history of Western philosophy. Um, and then it gets really postmodern because she and her teacher both realize that they're just characters in a novel. And the novel is coming to an end and they need to escape from the novel. Mm -hmm. um, and so you, you've got a very interesting end there. So those two books taught me you can mix fiction and non-fiction. And hmm. that's what I decided to do. I decided to have someone having a personal crisis. So as a young lad who's just killed someone in a car crash and, you know, his life totally unravels when, when he does this. Um, so he joins the Alpha course and there he meets Omega B, um, who gives him the opposite point of view. Uh, and that's how you get the title of the Omega course. Sounds and beautiful. It's, kind of philosophy. it's kind of a history of secular study of the Bible and what people have learned through secular study about how the Bible was written, how it came to be written, and who Jesus was and the historical Jesus. So it's a combination of those two things. Huh. Oh, very good. Well, I've got some meat of the program um, other than the book. I've got, uh, I uh, give you a cute clue in on uh, one of the Christian um, videos we'll be doing a little bit of a review on. And your review on it was how painful it was. So be prepared, folks. This one's juicy. <laughs> this is, uh, this is going to be, uh, this is going to be great. There yeah. you <laughs> Say that again. We'll really enjoy it. Two nice people. Yeah. Uh, how do I get this to go over there? Well, that's not good. Let's try that. There we go. All right. Uh, you can hear this all right? I'm so glad to be with you, Jimmy. Well, it's wonderful to have you. I just... I the, the <laughs> there's there's uh, several Jimmys today. I learned so much from you. I just... Uh, I love your biblical knowledge, period, but also the way that you understand the original languages and how that, you know, just kind of unfolds scripture. And I watch you, I'm, I'm sitting, watch you. this is your set in Russia, isn't it? It is. Yeah, you're, you're in Moscow, Russia. And yes, so I watch you I am. all the time on your TV show sitting right there. I was listening to you recently talking about your book, Apostles and Prophets, and uh, very, very insightful. Related. If you don't have a copy of that book, I'll send you one. I have one, I have one. Okay. I, I, I haven't read the whole thing, it is a big one, but uh, it is a- Ever heard of this book? I just like I was just going to say, don't send me a copy. <laughs> Fantastic book. So we're talking about your Life is too today, short. Today. <laughs> Matthew chapter twenty-four, and I want to dive right into it now. So, in your opinion, we we're li we're living in the last days, right? Absolutely, we're at the very end of the age. End of the age. So I say we're living at the end of the end times, and so the end of the end times. Yeah. Have, again. Again, like. <laughs> It's, uh, it's, it's been the end of the end times for all my life. I don't know if you remember, but, uh, back in the mid seventies, the Jehovah's witnesses were all in, yeah. uh, hair on fire mode that, uh, Jesus coming, Jesus coming. And that yeah. was the first time I was ever exposed to it. And I think just about every year of my life, I've heard some variation of, but, uh, it they're talking about, is it Matthew 24 they're talking about? Isn't that where it says, Jesus said, this generation, meaning the generation alive when he was alive, will not die before all this happens? 
Yeah, I believe all the synoptics have some variation of uh, yeah. that they're they're going to Mark and Matthew specifically. I think Luke has it, but it's a little more vague, if yeah. memory serves me correctly. And like St. Paul in his letters is saying, people shouldn't really get married because and, of the end times. But yes. if that's the only way you can avoid fornicating, well, go and get married. But wait a second, because Jesus is about to come back again. Yes, yes exactly. Yeah. Uh, who knew? Who knew that we'd still be here yeah. just under 2,000 years later? So... It just just wait until 2033. I'm sure they'll pull all the stops oh, out then. <laughs> it'll be all over the place, won't it? Yeah. <laughs> all right. Ember Ember's here. BS is here. It's good to see you. Tim Bob's here. Spooky's here. Hello from England. So, uh, Spooky also said that he um they tried to uh, Zen of the art of the motorcycle maintenance. Yeah. I, I I read it probably back in the 80s, something like that, and really loved it. I loved it. Um, and then I reread it just before I wrote my book. And I actually disagreed with what he was saying. Because <laughs> um, he's got this big thing, which is the Zen thing, that you have to be in the moment and you have to concentrate on what you're doing. And he talks about his hobby is motorcycle maintenance. Huh. And he complains about young mechanics maintaining their motorbikes. And they're listening to the radio. And he says they shouldn't be listening to the radio. They should be in the moment, you know, fully concentrating on listening to the radio. And I thought, yeah, it's all right for you to say that. It's your hobby. But it's their job. And if you're repairing motorbikes eight hours a day, five days a week, six days a week, you probably want to listen to the radio a little bit. Yeah. To get some music or something to listen to. So I didn't agree with everything he said, but I still loved the book. I thought it was great. Oh, yeah. Tim Bob. <laughs> Talk about some of the signs. You know, Matthew 24, the, some of the disciples asked Jesus, you know, what when the end was going to happen, all that. So, so he, he gave signs as, as, you know, to tell us when we were there. So tell us why you think we're there. Okay. Well, let's go to Matthew 24. Okay. All right. And I the discussion here, you were talking about this in one of the, one of your other broadcasts, yeah. how they give so much detail. Yeah, and you were saying so much detail is kind of a sign of BS. Yeah, I, to me, no offense, BS. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, one of the things that I um, continually want to state is if you read Exodus 20 on how the de details unfold about this false, uh, only worship this God, no idols, none of this, and it's the first four. And then the next six are, you know, the variations of thou shalt nots. And then it goes into, in uh, Exodus 21, like this elongated specifics about slavery. And my question to everybody is, is if this book is really about God and it's not about slavery, when it shows up right after the conversation about what God just gave us, <laughs> what is the book really about? And it's what all the details are about. So, yes, I my presupposition is that the whole book is deception and a scam. It's designed to make you mentally envision your um, mentally envision your romantic Ponzi scheme esqueness with an invisible idol. So, do we want to play uh, Matthew 24? Maybe? Yeah, we'll play. Let this play out. I want to go to verse 3, where we have the Olivet Discourse. Mm. And it says, As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. I really like that, because if you talk to Jesus privately, he'll tell you things that he won't tell other people. <laughs> but they came to him privately, and they said, Tell us, now here's some real key words, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Well, if you read this in Greek, it is real, real specific. For example, the word when doesn't mean, Lord, tell us generally. It's a Greek word, which means it's a Greek word, pote. Tell us exactly when, Lord. Nobody else is listening. Now you can tell. What's that? Well, when he goes on and on and on. When means when. That's all. 
Yeah. When means when. Plus, we want to know exactly when shall these things be and what shall be the sign. The word what in Greek is the little word T. It's T-I. It describes the most minute, minuscule detail. Wow. So they were literally saying, Lord, nobody else is listening. We want to know when this is going to happen exactly and exactly what will be the sign of your coming. And Jimmy, that word sign is the Greek word simeon. I'm sure you've studied it before. But it's the very word which was used to describe a sign that you would see as you were traveling along a road to let you know where you are and how much further you have to go. For example, I live just outside the city of Moscow. When we travel into Moscow, there are signs to tell us how far we've gone, how much further we have to go. If we didn't have a sign, I wouldn't know where I was. Right. These are so how long have we been observing these signs? Because all of my life, a memorable life, we've definitely had these signs. Yes, BS, he is talking about me. Me, me, me. Hmm. <laughs> a hell of a sign. I, I don't know what that means. Jesus is a champion eager edger. Champion edger. I don't know what that means. I do. It's a sexual reference. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> you it's dirty nice. dog, you. <laughs> Dave. Dave, are you putting, I've been told. Are you I've putting read naughty, naughty things into my chat? I never. <sighs> there are road signs. And so they were actually saying to the Lord, Lord, what will be the signs we see on the prophetic road? That's really what they were. Wow. The signs of the end of the world. And of course, there's never going to be an end of the world. But the word end is a Greek word, soon to lay us. It means the wrap up. Right. And the key is the word world. It's not the word gase, which would be the Greek word for the earth, or the word cosmos, which would be the universe. But here you find a Greek word ionos, which means the age. They were saying, when will we know we've come to the very end, the wrap up of this current age? And they asked for one <laughs> sign. And Jesus gave them a whole bunch. And that's what happens when you get along with Jesus. You ask him one thing, he'll tell you a lot of things. But then you come to verse 4. And Jimmy, I heard you teach on this the other day, and you were so right on. Jesus began with the most obvious sign that you've come to the end of the age. Now, some people might say, well, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars and nation against nation and earthquakes and famines. Well, those things have always happened. They're happening more now than they've ever happened. But they've always happened. And somebody could say, oh, come on, that's always gone on. So Jesus began well, with the sign that's it, most important for us to understand. And it's in. Okay, he's saying there are more wars now than there have ever been. Okay, nation rising against nation. Okay, as far as I'm aware, there are only two wars in the world now, localized wars, where it's nation against nation. One is Israel mm -hmm. against the Palestinians in Gaza, and the other one is his friends Russia invading Ukraine. That's it. Yeah. The rest of the world, there are a number of wars in the world. There's a civil war in Yemen. That is not nation against nation. There's a kind of low-intensity civil war in Burma, not nation against nation. There are a few low-intensity conflicts in Africa, not nation against nation. And in Sudan, there's a full-blown civil war. And then you've got places like Haiti where the gangs are taking over. That's not nation rising against nation. Okay, Most of the world is at peace. Apart from Ukraine, all of Europe is at peace. Uh, North America is at peace. South America is at peace. Um, in Asia, there's a war in Yemen, a low-intensity war in Burma, and the war in Gaza. And then in Africa, a few low-intensity civil wars. And he says, you know, there are more wars going on now than there have ever been. No, there aren't. What about the mm -hmm. Second World War? What about the First World War? What about the Napoleonic Wars? You know, what's happening yeah. now is nothing compared to what was going on then. So this yeah. is pure BS. Is, and it if, goes right through. If I'm not mistaken, and it depends on the scholarly uh, range, but Matthew is being written in between um, the First Jewish-Roman War and the Second if I remember correctly. 
So most of this stuff, I see a lot of rhetoric, wartime type of rhetoric of um, straddling the line of my my God's going to kick your God and a whisper campaign of rallying the troops to try to kick their butts again. But they always, the Romans always kick their butts instead, the Jewish butts instead. If I remember correctly, I need to refresh my memory on some of that stuff. Verse 4, Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed. It's the word blepo, but here it's the direct form blepete. It's like he's just grabbing hold of them. Stand up. Listen, he's trying to jerk them to attention. Take heed that no man deceive you. Mm. Deception is the most glaring sign that we've come to the end of the age. Yeah. And this particular word, deceive. So, my question to you is, is if the biggest form of deception, deception the there was a time when there was 0%, and then there was a time there wasn't 0%. Wouldn't that be the biggest moment of deception? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. I'm going to switch to Dan here. I'm a scholar of the Bible and religion, and the fit for today is Odd Pride's Shanidar One shirt. Let's take a look at a video. So the Bible says that Satan is crafty. It doesn't say he's creative, and there's a difference. Oh, so, whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, hold on. Say that again. <laughs> In Genesis, it says that he's crafty. Not creative. Not creative. So it doesn't actually ever say either thing about Satan. In Genesis 3.1, however, it says the serpent was arum, which can mean cunning, clever, crafty. Uh, but the identification of the serpent from the Garden of Eden with Satan is a post-biblical innovation. There is no syllable of the Bible that identifies the serpent in the Garden of Eden as Satan. He's been telling the same two lies. Same two lies. Since the beginning of time. First lie is eat the fruit and you will be like God. Eat this and you won't need God, you'll be God. The so two problems with this. The first is that according to the Bible, what the serpent said was not a lie. It was 100% true. Because the serpent says in verse 5, you will become like the gods, knowing good and evil. And then in verse 22, the story has God confirmed that that is true. Because God says, look, the human has become like one of us, to know good and evil. God themselves confirms that what the serpent said would happen is precisely what happened. The other problem... So, what do you think? Uh, what do you I think like there? I like this guy. I, I watched him on one of your other podcasts, mm -hmm. and he goes down to the footnotes in the Bible, doesn't he? Yeah. Uh, and he goes to, and the footnotes are often taking the modern translation and revealing what the original translate, what it originally said in Hebrew, or what it originally said in Greek, which can be quite different from the modern translation. the The example that I'm very familiar with is the one i can't remember the reference um it's where it's in deuteronomy i think and it's where it says um the most high gave jacob to to the lord and according to modern translations of the bible it's god decided that the israel will become his his nation and he decided he would make israel the chosen people but if you read the footnotes and you go to the Septuagint and things like that, it originally said the god El, who was the head of the local pantheon of gods, he gave Israel to Yahweh. So it wasn't God chose Israel as the chosen people. It's the chief of the gods, El, gave Israel to Yahweh. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's that's what mm. the Bible originally said, and translations have smoothed over this. Um, the word Israel itself is Israel, and you know who, which God a community worships by the names they give themselves and the names they give places, the names they give people. And Israel is a community that worship the God El, yeah. the pantheon of gods under him. Uh, and that's buried in the Bible. And he's the kind of guy who will notice this because he goes to the, the footnotes where it gives the alternative translations and things like that. Now, forgive me if I'm a little wrong here, but I 
I seem to remember the distinguishment between using El and using Yahweh were when the tribes were split and then they brought them back together. Yeah. And they, they married the, the Yahweh and the El figure from the north and the south. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's kind of, I think it's a lot more complex than that. Um, it was kind of noticed in the 18th century that the, the name of God in the, in the Old Testament, especially in the Pentateuch, switches between Yahweh and switches between El. And they eventually worked out that there were two separate strands within the Bible. There were the Yahweh strands and the El strands, um, which were married together and sort of woven together later. This is the documentary hypothesis. Um, and all Israelites agreed that God was called Yahweh. Um, when they became monotheistic, they stopped saying the name Yahweh and they would only use the name God. After that, mm. it, it was kind of forbidden to use the name of Yahweh. Um, there's some parts of the Bible where they call him Elohim until he reveals his name to Moses as Yahweh. Mm -hmm. From that point on, they call him Yahweh. Uh, Yahweh is translated in English Bibles as the Lord or the Lord God, and Elohim is translated in Bibles as, as God. Um, but El was the, the head of a pantheon of gods in Canaan, um, and Yahweh was part of that pantheon of gods. He came later, and the evidence these days in modern scholarship is saying until about the year 1000 BCE, the Israelites didn't worship Yahweh at all. And then Yahweh was imported into the region, probably from the south. So a tribe must have migrated north to the northern kingdom of Israel, imported Yahweh, uh, and then he became possibly under David, he became a royal god of the Israelites and gradually became their main god. Um, but, you know, the history of the Israelites is not what the Bible says. It's a much more complex history, and monotheism didn't really come till later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Eve is the Greek word planeo. If you're taking notes, it's P L A N A O. And the word planeo doesn't just mean to deceive, but it describes somebody who's gotten so lost morally, morally, that they can't find their way back. Wow. It was used in an agricultural sense to describe an animal that got so far off track it could never find its way back home. It was used to describe people who had once walked on a really well-worn, solid, solid, traditional path, but now planeo, this word deception, they have veered from it, and now they're walking right along the edge of a very treacherous cliff. And this was the word used by rabbinical writers in the intertestamental period between the Old and the New Testament. And during that period, as you know, Jimmy, they were really obsessed with the end times. They were trying to understand where they were in time. And they wrote a lot about this word planeo, deception. And okay. the rabbinical writer my question to you is very simply if if we have um oh let me share me also if uh if we share um something in common it, with his reference here to me he's describing abrahamic religions going down this path getting deceived finding themselves so far off the path of of human made knowledge and instead now this knowledge is being made up by this invisible esque abrahamic in my opinion is just an invisible idol that they were basically able to successfully transition uh idol worships of statues and statuettes and trinkets into an invisible being that this being doesn't actually exist and we've been deceived and we're so far off the track and we're so look f looking forward to either this invisible idol saving us or making its attempt to end the world in some variation. To me, that's what he's describing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what I hear with my ear and my, my brain, um, my brain ear. Yeah. I, and I think it's a difference between Britain and the United States that in the United States, people who believe this nonsense are pretty close to power in some places. 
or mm-hmm. in positions of power. And you, I saw Mike Pompeo on TV, uh, and he was talking about blah 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 until the rapture. And I thought, yeah. wow. I mean, he really believes this. I mean, there's two explanations. One is he's a shameless hypocrite <laughs> who will say anything it takes to get evangelicals to vote for him. In which case, a man like that should be nowhere near any center of power, or even scarier, that he actually believes this rubbish. In which case, yes. a man like this should no should be nowhere near any center of power. And Mike Pompeo. You you don't oh. have that in the UK. Um, the most religious prime minister we've had recently was Tony Blair. You, who was, you got a carriage? You got a carriage house? We're looking to move from Chicago all of a sudden. Yeah, <laughs> he he was very deeply Christian. He probably he didn't believe in the end times. I'm sure about that. But um, when somebody asked his spokesman about his religion, his spokesman just answered, "We don't do God." Oh. And what he was saying is, let's leave his religion out of it, because Britain is a very secular country. About mm. 50% of Brits would say, it doesn't mean they're atheists, but they say, I'm not affiliated to any religion. Yeah. Something like 50%. Um, our next prime minister, who's almost certain to win the next election, Keir Starmer, is an atheist. Mm. Oh, wow. And the, and the fact that he's an atheist, nobody cares. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Winston uh, Churchill was probably atheistic. Okay. He might have believed in God a bit. Oh, very nice. Um, but he he certainly did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God. And he kept quiet about it. He didn't let people know. Um, the next prime minister who came after him, Clement Attlee, was an atheist. Hmm. And the first Labour prime minister in 1924, Ramsay MacDonald, he was an atheist. We've had three atheist prime ministers. Wow. And we're about well. to get a fourth. Our current prime minister is a Hindu. Mm-hmm. And nobody can. No. It doesn't matter. And if any British politician was to stand up and say, blah, 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 until the rapture, they <laughs> would be just laughed out. You know, it would be career ending for them. So we're uh, in a very different well. place as a society from the USA where evangelicals are a clear and present danger, aren't they? I I believe so. Yeah. I believe so. There there is a documentary the that um I think everybody should watch from um uh you know I'm gonna leave it in the description, but I, I do plan on having a future podcast where we go over um where we go over this uh video, but it's um let's see uh, it's from, I forget his name. You know what? We'll, we'll play this and then I'll, I'll come back with it. Here's the prophetic voices of that age said, you'll know when you've come to the end of the age. And here's what they wrote. They said, demons of delusion wow. will be released in the earth and people will begin to believe what is contrary to science. It will be an age of lunacy. Mm -hmm. And they use this word planeo to describe that age. Well, welcome to today. It's where we are. We're living in the age of lunacy. Delusional thinking has taken over. And Jesus said, when you see this, well, there's this biggest foremost sign, wake up, stand up straight. You have come to the end of the age. Well, that's, that's, we, that's what we see all around us. The um, gender thing that's going on right now. Uh, yeah, Amber. Talking about you, sister. So, uh, I find that uh, pretty compelling. And I really like this uh, comment right here. Uh, is it Where did it go? Oh, yeah. What are the ear locations? you got tux that's funny he's so funny i'm gonna skip ahead because i think they do like an advertisement here brown myself it, it is going to be a great day also pat will be having there and so go elect your exact seat that is a difference we have if you're a subscriber not not a youtube subscriber if you're a paid in times.com end time guys it's the end time 
<laughs> so I found it. I it's massive. Says, if you subscribe, you won't have to subscribe for very long. <laughs> <laughs> just That's be a right. few weeks. It only cost you a few dollars. <laughs> yes. Yes. The luna the lunacy around yesterday's eclipse and end times caused because of insert boogeyman here. Just just blows my mind. All right. Sixteen. Do you believe there's any hope? Like when we're talking about, you know, preaching the gospel or whatever, or how to respond to people who are reprobate. Is there hope for those people of receiving the truth? I know God can reach anyone, but is there a point in time? Because 2 Thessalonians 2 says, uh, Satan will come with all unrighteous deception. And I believe it's the next verse that says, and because they did not receive the love of the truth, so as be saved, God will give them over to a depraved mind. And, and so it talks there about uh, he will send them strong delusion. And that so, word delusion. That word delusion is the word planeo. It's the same word. Oh wow! And so, there is there is there a difference between deception and delusion? And when God gives somebody over to delusion, can that person be reached, or is that something we need to be worried about? In other words, preach the gospel to everybody. So, huh, do you, do you remember what he's about to say here? <laughs> I don't know. Is he going to say, um, all you have to do is send a donation and you'll be all right? <laughs> well, <laughs> <You'll be saved. laughs> we'll, we'll unspool that plan by God uh, if you just donate now. Only they can. But for, but for a mind that is reprobate, a mind that has been wrongly modified, that's really what it is. That's what's happening to children in school. That's exactly right. Mm. That's what. Mm -mm. So to me, listening to this, if the source of the majority of humans' deception is because of a book that they're preaching for, well, I guess, how do I ask the question, physician heal thyself to the religious end times prophet uh, from the outskirts of Moscow? It's, I mean, the, these people... I don't watch a lot of these people's videos <laughs> because they <laughs> wind me up. <laughs> they really wind me up. We we don't see, you know, we have TV channels with these people, and I skip those TV channels when I'm flicking through the channels finding something interesting to watch because they're just latching onto anything they don't like, aren't they? That I'm I think sure, so. I'm sure once upon a time it was the emancipation of slaves. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure another time it was mis what is it, miscegenation when, when mixed race marriages happened. I'm sure that was a sign of the end times. And now it's gays there and was. Now it's trans people. Well, what's it gonna be next? It was gays. It was gays, and then it was Obama, and then it was gays again, and then it was uh I don't know. Uh, it's always been something. Something yeah. is always labeled as this is the sign. I want to play uh, some more of Dan. In the Psalm, the notion that God has made us a little lower than the gods, like the gods, not exactly equal to the gods, and certainly not God, and therefore not in need of God. Second lie is right after it. Naked, shamed, they hid. That's the second lie. You're so bad, God could never love you. Neither the serpent nor the narrative in any way, shape, or form whatsoever indicates that they hid because they were not good enough. The narrative indicates that when they gained this knowledge, human wisdom, they realized they were naked, they were naive, they were childish before, but they grew up, they matured, realized they were naked, had the capacity for embarrassment, for shame, and things like that. And so, may so my question to you is, let's play him again. And when God gives somebody over to delusion, can that person be reached, or is that something we need to be worried about? In other words, preach the gospel to everybody. Jimmy, they can. But for, but for a mind that, that is reprobate, a mind that has been wrongly modified, that's really what it is. That's what's happening to children in school. That's exactly right. That's what's happening in the media. Right. So what's happening in social media, in the news every night. They're pounding the minds of society, right. trying to lead society in a new direction. Right. Well, Okay. Here's my question to you. If we were once upon a time nude and loved being nude, and then we were told you need to be clothed, or some variation of the religious saying, you 
can't do it the way you're doing it because that is the sign of this kind of mind. And they are under the influence of this delusion that the deception that is in the Garden of Eden as the foundation for the deception that becomes infected into our minds and that this book is the one that's relieving you from it, but it's actually the one that's bringing the deception right into our minds. Which is the better point of contact? If we look at somebody who wants to be trans, is that the same as wanting to be nude? Is that the same as expressing ourselves in the appropriate, innocent, childlike manner? And these naysayers whose minds have been infected with the deception of talking serpents, the deception of false idols that are visible and preaching all of these things just to use you for whatever reason they're using you to, to always continually get to this end time. We got to get to this end time and you got to be right. Which one, which one does the stage set? And in my opinion, they are exhibit a for the knowledge of good and evil part of that deception tree. And myself and Ember are the ones who are just looking at all the other trees and going, well, we really enjoy these other trees. And trans is just another boogeyman for being nude. I don't know. Tell me I'm wrong. Yes. The tree shape. Tim, Bob, you're so good at this, <laughs> but I guess my point is, is I love knowledge of life. I like the tree of life. And I believe when you no longer use the Bible as your um, pathway for the existence, always believing that, that we're in the end times, always uh, being in this feared mode of what if I get punished or some variation. This inflicts into the mind something that it takes a lot to remove it. But you can. You can, be, you can go back to that tree of life where you feel comfortable in whatever skin is. And it's, it's better than the knowledge of good and evil tree. And I think they're preaching being, enjoying that knowledge of good and evil tree. And they don't realize it. That's where the trap begins from the Bible. Is love the good and evil tree. Anything to add to the conspiracy whack job that just uh, said things? <laughs> A reprobate mind can be put back in order, but it requires repentance, yeah. which, by the way, the word repentance means to change the way you right. think. Mm -hmm. it, re it requires bending your mind to the Word of God. And when you have a mind that has been modified and is now defective, that's really what it is. It requires a tremendous will. I'm going to force myself to submit to the Word of God until my mind is reshaped to think the thoughts of God. And that is why very few people do it. Yeah. Okay. If, if this is the Word of God, then I would be in agreement with Rick here. But I don't believe it's in the Word of God. It's in the Word of humans. It's deceiving humans. humans. And, and the, the other question is, if it's the Word of God, which Word of God uh, are you going to go for? Because the Bible contradicts itself all over the place. You know, all you, over. you've got one part which says what revenge is good, you know, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And another part which says if someone strikes you on one cheek, then you turn the other cheek. Well, mm -hmm. one of those is wrong. It could be both of them are wrong, but they cannot both be right because they're completely saying the opposite thing. Uh, and so... To, to say, I, I read one book recently, it's a book by a Christian writer, a very liberal Christian writer called The Human Face of God. And he says, there is no such thing as somebody who believes that the Bible is without error. Nobody believes this because you can't believe it because it is so full of contradiction mm. that if you believe one part is true, you have to therefore believe the other part is false. 
and that all you get is people who are cherry picking the bible to suit the way they think mm -hmm. and unfortunately you've got bigots who cherry pick the bits of the bible which are bigoted and you've got liberals who cherry pick the bits of the bibles which are more liberal and which are more loving um or you can be perhaps like me and not cherry pick any of it um there's a few passages i quite like and a few passages i quite enjoy but i i don't get my inspiration from there yeah i th i think you uh, had read a blog uh that you posted that there was um a 400 and you, you yeah, picked out one, 400 one and some is, it's 439 contradictions in the bible 439 contradic contradictions mm -hmm. I, I is as somebody who believes that this is just a literary function they survive just fine together yeah. yeah if it's the word of god they they don't necessarily but apologists will definitely pretzel themselves to make it make it work yeah i mean i i've been i've been writing a blog post recently which is about the nativity and about the stories in matthew and the story in luke and there's no way you can align those stories mm -hmm. they say completely different things you know they they both have a genealogy of joseph yeah harmonizing that's the word um they both have a genealogy of joseph and i, I put the two genealogies side by side and they don't cross over at all. They're totally different. So how can that be the word of God? Yeah, it, it has to be the word of humans. If Luke is the word of God, then Matthew isn't. If Matthew is the word of God, then Luke isn't. It can't both be the word of God. Uh, I, I think they're the, the writings of humans. Yeah. Just selling a story. Designing a system in which you can be mentally instructed to do things that you believe are true, but they quite possibly are deception. Yeah. The, the, what... Mus the Muslims have got a way of harmonizing. Where the Quran says one thing and what, it says another thing later, they say, well, God changed his mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we'll go with what he said later. <laughs> they grew up. up. They matured realized they were naked had the capacity for embarrassment for shame and things like that and so made loincloths and hid from god because they had knowledge of their nakedness which is why god says who told you you were naked you are not supposed to know that you are supposed to be still in a childish infantile state and not care about being naked around other people this has absolutely nothing to do with any lie from the serpent or with any idea that they're not good enough Every young man I've met. So one of the funny things that I've never been able to get a good answer to is there really anything that um, Adam could have eaten to to make God have to do this scramble according to the to the Bible. Are you frozen on me, Paul? No, I think I'm you're still frozen. Here. I'm oh, still there you are. Yeah. I mean, hi, Earl. I, I, I'm listening to what this guy is saying. It's very interesting what he's saying, isn't it? That, uh, um, and the the other thing he keeps saying is the gods, rather than God. Hmm. Yeah. The, when when this was written, the people who wrote it were not monotheists; they were polytheists. They believed that there were multiple gods and Jews or Israelites should only worship one of them. But the idea that there was only one God, it's not in, in this. I like this guy. He he goes right into the text. And yeah. He analyzes what it's really saying. This is where the deception was. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Tim. Thank you, Tim, Bob. Um. Today living between those two lies you're so good you don't need god which is what the world's telling them we're so bad god can never want you which is what this shame guilt culture is telling them the only way to beat deception is with truth you're not so good that you don't need god as a matter of fact you're weak without god you can do nothing you think you're bad and god can never love you the truth is you're actually worse than you're willing to admit but you're more loved than you could ever imagine oh yeah <laughs> 
How do you like that? Let's see what Dan Dan's gonna give uh, Dan's gonna give a little rebuttal to that. When we see young men take hold of that, it's like the weight of the world comes off, and they can run into the full inheritance that God has for them. Certainly, there are folks who have a disposition that allows them to thrive with this idea that they're worthless, but God loves them anyway. But for many people, that results primarily in shame and anxiety uh, and trauma. And so that is not helpful counsel for most people. All right. I want to show this meme right here. This is uh, posted on Robin's uh, channel earlier this week. It's a picture of the magician uh, pulling one of their saw and half sawing in half a human trick and it's uh losing one's faith is like seeing the magic behind a trick once you see it the illusion can't be unseen and to me when i see references to delusion references to the bible's um narrative of of deception in the beginning and now we're at the end and deception and deception is everywhere i see it like this i mm. see the illusion i know how it worked and I would like you to see it as well if you want to. So huh. I think uh, I could play a little bit more of our friends over at uh, Rick and Jimmy uh, telling us about um, their end times delusions and, and such. But I think the source material for the majority of the delusion and deception is actually a book called Holy. All right. I like that meme. It's a good meme. Yeah. Yeah. A, a lot Robin. of things. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. And once I figured out, because originally I got to this path, I, 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 for a bit, I thought that Satan and Jesus are actually the same. They've run such a similar path. And then I came to the conclusion, you know, I don't think there's such thing as Satan and demons. And then I went seeking for that information, and I couldn't find any, which then means, well, it's just humans deceiving humans. Humans wrote this stuff. Zero percent written by God, 100 percent written by humans. Yeah, very much, very much. And one, one thing he was saying is that Satan in the Old Testament is a very minor character. Mm. Um, he basically appears in the book of Job, um, mm -hmm. where he is doing, he's, he's being a bit of a provocateur, but he's doing what God tells him to do. Yes. You know, he, he has this bet with God, and God says, okay, go and kill Job's family, go and cover him in boils. So Satan does it. So Satan is a minor deity. I, actually, is, I, I think is, it's the reverse, Paul. I, I think Satan says to God, Hey, this is what, yeah. Um, this is what I would like done is if he's filling out a requisition and God signs off on the requisition, yeah. Because the the fire that destroys the fields and the livestock comes from heaven; it's fire from God. Yeah, but Satan is very much he's a he's one of God's minions. Yeah, he's he's person. a button man of some sort. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's much later. Um, probably in the Persian period, under the influence of Zoroastrianism, that he becomes an antagonist for God. And yeah. then in later Judaism and Christianity, he becomes a much bigger figure. Um, in Islam, Satan is a sort of comical figure. Um, and in Islam, at the end times, Satan will be redeemed. He's not seen as, as the, the monster that he's seen as in Christianity. The Act Three boss. That's funny. Yeah, and as as what's the name of the guy? Is it Dan? As he was saying, Dan. the idea that the serpent is Satan that was introduced much later. Yes, um, after the Midrash. Yeah, it's it's there's definitely um, uh, between this the first telling of the David census and the second telling of the David census, there is the evolution of just a touch of this this um, Satan character coming into fullness. 
yeah. but he's still just Hasatan. He's he's just the adversary, not an actual proper pronoun being like he is in the New Testament. Very much so. Yeah. And I even read that until the Middle Ages in Christianity, Satan wasn't such a big thing. It was in the Middle Ages that he became a real antagonist for God. Um, uh, probably because of Milton's Paradise Lost. Yeah. And, I, uh, and, uh, Milton and Dante, or were Milton and Dante. And Dante, yeah. What was, in, what was in the culture anyway. Um, but, it, you know, it's something that developed much later. It's certainly not something that comes from the original books of the Old Testament. All right. Well, uh, what do you say we talk a little bit more about your book, and then we'll do a moment of Zen? And um, I have in the description uh, a link to your uh, WordPress, which has your blog on it as well, uh, your Twitter account. Uh, are you on YouTube's? No, I'm not on YouTube. No. And I have one more uh, link in there. Oh, a link to Amazon for your book. Is there an audiobook version? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. I bought the microphone, but I haven't recorded it yet. I see. All right. So that's kind of one of my tasks over the next six months or something like that uh, to get an audio version up and running. Um, okay. Shall I explain a little bit about how, how the book works? So my protagonist, uh, Ross, he joins the Alpha Course and he's uh, a student on the Alpha Course. The Alpha Course is a kind of introduction to a, a fairly conservative mainstream version of, of Christianity. And on the Alpha Course, there's a girl called B. Her nickname is B. Um, her, her actual nickname is Omega B. And she, she's a theology student. And... If you listen to Robert Unshaw's podcast, he interviews quite a few people who have been strong Christians, gone to university, studied theology, and then found their beliefs undermined by studying theology. Because when you study theology as a secular course, you learn a lot of things which undermine conservative interpretations of the Bible and things like that. So she starts off in the first session. Somebody asks her, what, do theology, what does theology say about um, the creation story against Darwin? And she just gives an off-the-cuff answer. Um, there's two creation stories. There's Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, um, which contradict each other, so they can't possibly be true. And she just sort of says that as an off-the-cuff thing. And then the protagonist, Ross, asks her later, what do you mean there's two stories? I thought there were one. And she comes back to him and tells him, read the two creation stories, read Genesis 2, read Genesis 1, and look at the order of creation in the two stories. And it's different. Yeah, one has got um, Adam, all of the animals, and then Eve. And the other one has got all the animals, then Adam, then Eve. And they can't both be correct. One of these has to be wrong. And then she introduces him to the documentary hypothesis, uh, which is the idea that the Old Testament or the, the early books of the Old Testament are in fact four different books which have been mixed together and woven together. And as an appendix at the end of the book, I put the story of Noah. And if you read the story of Noah in the Bible, it's quite repetitive. And what scholars have done is they've unwoven the two stories of Noah. In one story, God is called God. In the other story, he's called the Lord God. And each of these two strands makes sense by itself. Hmm. So in an appendix at the end of the book, you can actually go on Amazon and read this without buying the book. Okay, if you go to the paperback version, go for C inside and scroll right down to the appendix at the end of the book, appendix one. You can see one version of Noah, and then you can see another version of Noah, and then you can see how the two versions of Noah are mixed together in the Bible. Um, and then, you know, the story, the, the narrative is, is going on and on at the same time. Um, and next she starts to tell them about the historical Jesus. 
and about the very different view of Jesus as an apocalyptic preacher, uh, a minor peasant preacher that secular scholarship has found. Um, and one of the characters says, yeah, but how do you know this version is true? So she gives a history of how people discovered that Jesus was a minor peasant preacher rather than the son of God. And it's a story of 2,200 years of scholarship to get to that point of view. Um, and then in later parts, she, she writes about how the Bible came to be written, uh, which is a very, very different story. And I think one of the key things, this is something I only learned about quite near the end. I think I'd already written the book and then I read a book. I don't know if you, you've heard of the book, a lady called Francesca Stravanopoulou. Oh, yes. Written a book called God and Anatomy. <laughs> yeah. Um, and what she does in her book, she goes through all the bits of the Bible where it describes God's body. It talks about God's hand, God's feet, God's face, uh, and God's genitals. They get a mention too in the Bible as well. And what she says is that when these passages were written, they were written to be taken literally. That they were talking about God's hand, God's feet, God's face, God's head, God's genitals. And the reason they were writing this was the people were not monotheists. They were polytheists. They believed that Yahweh was one of many gods, but he was the only God that they should worship because of the covenant that Moses had agreed with Yahweh. Um, and it's only much later when monotheism was born that people started saying, oh, you shouldn't take this literally. It's figurative. And it doesn't really mean God's hand, God's breath, God's face, whatever. It's, it's metaphorical. Um, and this is something, it's actually a very old Christian tradition of not taking the Bible literally. Um, if you go back to the third century, uh, a guy called Oregon, who was one of mm. the founding fathers of the church, mm -hmm. um, he said it's childish and silly to take Genesis creation stories literally. Uh, he talked about the two creation stories. I can't remember which one he said was childish and which one was silly. But one of them was the story, you know, the idea that God made the world in six days and took a rest on the seventh. Come on, he says, that's just silly. This was saying this in the third century, a very long time ago. Uh, and then the idea that God planted a garden in Eden and was wandering around looking for Adam. Come on, that's just, I can't remember, it's either childish or silly. You'd have to be very silly to believe that. And... For most of the Middle Ages, these stories were not taken literally. They were taken figuratively. There were debates in the church which bits to take literally and which bits to take figuratively. Um, but the Catholic Church also wanted to restrict how people interpreted these things, but people didn't take them literally at that time in the way that fundamentalists do today. Um, the Catholic Church would, back in the Middle Ages, would even admit that there were contradictions in the Bible. And they would say, yes, these contradictions are there for a reason. They are there to remind us not to get hung up on the surface meaning of the text, but to look for the deeper spiritual meaning inside the text. And then what happened was that the printing press was invented. And when the printing press was invented, much to the Catholic Church's horror, the Bible was translated into vernacular languages and thousands and then millions of people started to read the Bible and to interpret themselves. And then the idea of taking the Bible literally took hold. And that's what these fundamentalist preachers don't understand, that their idea of taking everything literally is a modern idea. It's not going back to their roots. It's interpreting the Bible in a 20th and 21st century way. That's the really weird thing about them, that they are, for all their craziness, modern. So my character, Omega B, she is writing about all these things. And as she writes about them, she's thinking, 
oh no, I really don't believe this crap anymore. <laughs> and she loses her faith, which is a personal crisis for her because her faith has been key to her identity. Um, and so, you know, you've got the, the conflicting ideas of B and the Alpha Course, which are, are a big part of the story. Um, but at the same time, you've got the story of this young man, Ross, who has accidentally killed someone and is trying to find a way to come to terms with it. And does he come to terms with it through religion or does he find some other way to come to terms with what he's done? And so the last part of the book is talking about his personal crisis and how he deals with that. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of a, it's like Zen and it's like Sophie's World. It's, I'm trying to mix fiction and nonfiction in a book uh, in a way that will inform people and will entertain them at the same time. Beautiful. All right. I, you, do you think uh, I should play the uh, intro one more time? Or th what I did on the intro? So let's have the intro. My blurb. Yeah, I think I'm gonna. <laughs> yeah, this was written by uh, this was written by Paul, by the way, not me. I just uh, I just scooped it off of uh, Twitter. I got it off the tweets. Yeah. If I can find it, here it is. Can you live with yourself when you have killed somebody? This haunting question consumes Ross Collins whose life unravels when he causes a fatal accident just one day after passing his driver's test. Sinking into the morass of despair and self-loathing, he seeks refuge in the Alpha Course, hoping to find redemption through Christianity. There he encounters Omega B, a theology student grappling with her own crisis as a faith that has always defined her collapses. B challenges the message of the Alpha Course, offering Ross a very different perspective on Christianity and the Bible, as he desperately looks for a path of redemption, and she tries to work out who she is and what she is going to do with her life. Their story unfolds against a backdrop of conflicting ideas, the clash between Alpha and Omega. Thank right. you for that, Jimmy. My pleasure. Um, my uh, my friend here at uh, sh she she loves my voice, by the way, and um, she uh, she suggested. Uh, I don't know if you saw this, but uh, when I asked if there was an audio book, <laughs> she said there was. I don't know if you saw the uh, live stream yeah, I did I earlier, but that. okay. So. All right. Uh, well, normally I do a breakdown of uh, a simple task of why I'm not. Today we're going to do Bowtie 8. So beware of your free gift of salvation as it uh, it is what entices you to accept those delusions and deceptions as God, Yahweh El, I don't believe exists. I don't believe God at a son who exists as a supernatural being. He was just a human. And then the Holy Spirit, Satan, devil, demons, angels, bad angels, heaven or hell. I don't believe any of these exist. And the many times that I've asked for evidence that they do exist, I have yet to see some. But if some comes across, I will still need an alibi that God, Yahweh, or El isn't in cahoots with that Satan figure, uh, nor the Jesus figure, nor the Holy Spirit. And that the Bible didn't have one word of deception from that deceiving being. And that the angels in Revelations 12, 9, because some of those are bad, didn't administer to Jesus. So. I'm with you that, there. I'm you're with, with me you there. there. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, we, uh, we did a little name dropping of Job. So our moment of Zen that I already had queued up is Perfect, perfect for today. Uh, Paul, thanks again for having uh, being on the show and program. Uh, thanks to the audience uh, members who uh, chimed in and uh, viewed and all everybody in the future. Please, uh, please use the uh, description to uh, find Paul and his book and his information. And uh, when you were on um, on shows 
podcast. It just sounded so good to me. Everything you said just just verberated sound. It just sounded perfect. How could it be so perfect? So well, thanks, Jimmy. It's been really fun. I've enjoyed. I've enjoyed. I've listened to several of your podcasts uh, before I came on, and I enjoyed listening to them. And I'll listen to plenty more. And it's been really great to to speak to you. Yeah. And yeah. We'll stay in All touch. Right. All right. Well, here is uh, here is your moment of Zen and uh, bow tie uh, bow tie. But I just got blessed with a good wife. Not every guy has a good wife. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, think about Job in the Old Testament. Think about Job's wife. She must have been a real piece of work. I mean, the devil took everything from Job, man. Killed his kids, killed his servants, killed his livestock, covered Job in boils and sores. But his wife did not die. <laughs> That's saying something right there, isn't it? Like, hey, devil, Job's wife's right over there. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Trust me, leave her. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Both have.